Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, this season was the first Saturday program's 20th anniversary. We marked the milestone by um, putting together a short um, retrospective slideshow, which is on our website at firstsaturdaypdx.com. So we invite everyone to take a look at that. Um, and then perhaps when we're able to rejoin in person, we might be able to do another kind of um, commemoration activity together. Um, today, we're so delighted to have guest speaker, Dr. Ina Asim from the University of Oregon. She'll be speaking today and the title of the presentation is Silk and Sericulture, Inspired by a Social Contract. Um, it'll be on the topic of textiles um, and uh, the gallery at the University of Oregon. The title of today's program is Silk and Sericulture, a Beauty Inspired by a Social Contract. And I'm really very happy to have uh, Dr. or Professor Ina Sim as our speaker. And going back, looking at our history of First Saturday, she did, uh, she's done a number of programs for First Saturday. And I believe the first one that she did goes back to December 2004. So, you know, it's wonderful that we've had this long association with uh, uh, Dr. Asim. Uh, today, her uh, program will uh, introduce us to Chinese textiles, but to look at Chinese textiles as art. And uh, in her, uh, I believe in her uh, presentation, uh, she will also give a brief account of uh, collecting and preserving textiles as exemplified by Gertrude Bass Warner, the founder of the museum at the University of Oregon. Uh, about a month ago, I had a chance to meet with Ina and the current curator, and I had a chance to see the um, renovated uh, uh, Chinese gallery. And I have to tell you, it's a very special gem of a museum for all of us here in Oregon. And it's open now, I believe, and I really would encourage everyone to go there. Uh, everything is displayed so well. Uh, there's a wealth of uh, Chinese art, uh, and it looks at not only ancient art, but also what you might find currently in China. So, uh, and again, they're famous for their beautiful jade pagoda. And I had a chance to look at it just a little bit more uh, this time. And really, I, I didn't quite realize that pagoda what is it, 15 to 20 feet? And anyways, the way they constructed it in jade was constructed as though they built a, uh, a new building. And in uh, one of the openings on each level, uh, if you ever visit there, uh, take a flashlight uh, or a light because within them you'll see uh, a little gilt bronze Buddha. Uh, and Ina, uh, I, I, I like to mention that uh, she is a professor of Chinese history at the University of Oregon. And her interest has been in archeology span and the history of China's material culture developments. And through her studies uh, on the Song uh, Dynasty tombs and the urban culture of pre-modern China. This has developed her particular interests about China, and it's going to be. And I expect that that, that will be reflected in her uh, program today. So, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome and ask everyone to join us. Uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ina Asim. Ina? Congratulations to all of you for 20 years of First Saturday. That is amazing. I wasn't aware of this. Yes, our connection goes back a long time, but I didn't know that this is really an honor that I can be part of the 20 year anniversary. So I will start to share my screen and then 
we will start with this presentation. Okay, you should all be able to see the uh, the title of today's talk, Silk and Sericulture, Beauty Inspired by a Social Contract. And I decided to call it this way because originally this, um, the idea of presenting to you came in a conversation with Dennis when I mentioned that we recently had a Mellon Foundation funded project at the University of Oregon that brought or that was inspired to bring collections from museums or from two institutions, that was the, the general premise, together. Two, two collections of institutions that are physically separated and could be linked electronically to give access to more um, potential users. And so we decided once the Mellon Foundation selected the University of Oregon Art Museum, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, and the University of uh, Oregon Muse uh, um, Library, the Knight Library, and their collections, we needed to determine which focal points would be most interesting to potential users. And of course, Gertrude Bass Warner's collection, collecting activities, stretched from collecting art to also giving to the university um, her correspondence, her collection of slides, a lot of them lantern slides of photographs, etc. And so basically what happened was that the art is in the art collection and printed materials, her correspondence, etc., are in special collections and university archives in Knight Library. And so this is one of three Asia related projects. I will talk about this a little later. Um, what we did was focusing on um, sericulture and silk in this one project that was headed by me, but uh, that I could not have done with the enormous support from both the museum and the library. And instead of getting you sort of just an impression of the website, I thought I should explore a little more of these two points, silk and sericulture, because the website, after all, you can explore by yourselves. I will introduce it to you and I will give you the resources that I think are interesting for this audience. And of course, the URL so that you can um, look at the website in greater detail. And of course, I have in this PowerPoint presentations, parts of, especially textiles of the, the website that you can then explore um, on your own. And somehow, my, PowerPoint doesn't move. Oh, here we go. So yes, now it's, uh, it works. I want to briefly talk about Gertrude Bass Warner as a collector of textiles and the textile collection. Some of you may be very familiar with this because recently Anne Rose Kitagawa, the curator of the chief curator of the George Schnitzel Museum of Art gave you a presentation. But for those of you who may not have been able to attend I will make a few remarks and then we'll talk about sericulture and how sericulture is depicted and what this actually means. And finally, I will move to the digital exhibition. The section on sericulture, which explains the processes of the production of silk, will show you depictions of seasonal processes of agriculture and sericulture as they were first captured by a Southern Song official, presumably to remind Emperor Gaozong of his moral obligation towards the rural population, since it was the diligent and reliable work of the men working in the fields and the women who worked in silk production. And there is always this connection of labor in a gendered way, men work in the fields, women work at home, 
though we will see that this is not uh, really how it happens. And this formed the basis of imperial wealth and the legitimacy of imperial power. And as the Song official thought, emperors should need it to be reminded at certain times. As we will see this pictorial problem, a program of the images that can be interpreted as capturing the social contract between the rural population as guarantors of social stability and the imperial government as their source of support and protection was well known throughout Asia. Versions of these images that you will see were commissioned by the emperors of China and of both of Chinese and Manchu ethnicity alike who included them in their collections. The images should also become the basis for multiple adoptions in China, Korea, and Japan, and they should leave their mark on the imagination, China as the ideal state led by an enlightened ruler in the, in the minds of European intellectuals of the late 17th and throughout the 18th century. I think you will uh, enjoy that part. Now, I want to show you the resources so the photographs, letters, diaries of Gertrude Bass Warner are today in SCORE, Special Collections and University Archives. And here's the URL, and I can provide that also through the chat or send it to uh, PDX to uh, the team so that they can share it with you later. And then the digital exhibition itself has textiles from the Chinese collection and the images of sericulture, which are divided, some of them are at uh, in the JSMA and some in SCUA will uh, be introduced or can be explored through this website that is um, that reflects the results of the Mellon Foundation project. Very briefly, a short remark about Gertrude Basorna. She was a collector of textiles while she lived in Asia and different from what I read by some people and uh, the idea that she stayed there for a very long time. She actually lived in Shanghai between 1904 and 1909. And then she returned throughout um, the 1910s and 20s multiple times to uh, uh, China and to Asia and traveled there extensively. And that um, helped her to reestablish or keep in connection with people who um, she commissioned to collect for her. And then they made suggestions to her of um, which objects to acquire. And from there, she made decisions if she was not in Asia at the time herself. And her motivation was not so much to, as we see it in many collections, the just the curiosity or um, the exotism in objects that uh, were Asian, but she really, because she had experienced so much while she was in Asia, and uh, um, because she really wanted to leave a mark with a personal engagement in making a change, she thought that having an art museum would help to alert the minds of people who visit this museum of the situations that uh, other people, other parts of the world, other continents are exposed to. And so she thought about promoting learning about Asia through art and also stimulate cultural, intercultural exchange. She really helped to establish um, an exchange, student exchange at the University of Oregon. She actually uh, introduced the, the first Asian student who came to the University of Oregon um, was a student from Japan. And uh, she also institutionalized at the time a writing contest, an essay contest for students in Oregon about um, uh, uh, focusing on topics about Asia. So her 
motivation, cultivate cultural appreciation and tolerance was at the forefront of founding this museum. She was then especially fascinated by silk production and by textiles and at some point started to uh, rear silkworms in her Shanghai home. If you're interested and explore Oregon Digital, the resource I just showed, you can find images and I think Anne and Rose Kitagawa showed you an image of her um, collection of silkworms and how she tried to raise them in her attic in Shanghai. Her textile collection is especially interesting because it's not limited to status garments like the precious robes, the dragon robes you all know about, but she also shows and collected um, parts of garments that I will talk about um, helped in the modular production of, of garments that would allow people who were not of the, the means of the emperor who could just order his robes um, to get into a fashionable attire. More about that later. And she also uh, documented conditions of work in the countryside, in agriculture and sericulture. She took lots of photographs. She was really interested in documenting the um, labor processes of labor in the, the countries she visited. So there are photographs of you know, the countryside in China, in Japan, in Korea. So the first um, group of images I want to show you are, as we talk about silk, a Taoist liturgical vestments of which the JSMA has three. I show you two. And just as examples of what you will find in this Mellon Foundation project, this digital exhibition. Then I will show you ceremonial hangings, talk a little bit about fashionable clothing and semi-formal court attire, and then point you to point your attention to the modular um, accessories of clothing. And then we will talk about sericulture. So here is a Daoist priest's robe. The, the, the robe of descent, as it is called, Yangi, with floor, a four clawed dragon roundel design. And I'm just trying to show you what was possible through the investment of the museum to get textiles into um, high resolution images that I was allowed to use then for my website. And so when you are on the website and you want to see details, you can zoom as in as much as you see here to see a fairly small um, detail on the left shoulder of the Taoist priest robe will be, it will be expanded to the level that you can see here where you can actually see the stitches and the couching with gold thread the embroidery shading, um, as you see at the, the bottom here, when you look at the emblem of the hair in the moon who's pounding the elixir of immortality. And there is the second robe, Taoist robe, that is also on the website that you can see in detail with um, the sacred mountains, the, the sacred symbols for the sacred mountains and the, the uh, tower of the, that is said to be the residence of the immortals. And then here's one, one of my favorite <laughs> objects in the collection, in the textile collection. It's um, a ceremonial hanging that celebrates the birthday of the Queen Mother of the West. And she's said to have held a banquet on her birthday. And of course, what does she present to the immortals that she has invited to participate in this banquet? Peaches, the peaches of immortality that only ripen every 3000 years. And then of course, these, this illustrious community of immortals participates in the banquets and has a chance to 
enjoy these features of immortality. And you see, when you look at these um, figures in detail, that again, you have a very fine view of the, hand, the, the, the craftsmanship, the artisanship of embroidery. It is quite fascinating to see both weaving structure and embroidery in these textiles, which you can explore. Here, another detail that shows you how the peaches of immortality really are exceptional. Here, there are two children who jointly, in a joint, uh, joint effort, uh, carry the peach of immortality to the waiting immortals and more peaches on the right side appearing. And there is an, uh, one example of a vertical ceremonial hanging. This is also a detail, the uh, uh, centerpiece of the ceremonial hanging that is in the collection. And it shows the um, celebration of a high birthday of this gentleman to your right. And you see children of the family pay their respect and he is blessing them in return. And if you look at the faces of the old gentleman and his wife sitting on the other side of these of the two children, you can see that the embroiderers took great uh, care to really reflect the age of these uh, venerable people, but also they took great care in um, including the detail in the clothing. So this is the image in the image. <laughs> in the ceremonial hanging, you have the reflection of the clothing and the detail expected for a high ranking person at, the t uh, at this time. And you also see that there have been invited a troupe of actors who will perform in honor of this old gentleman on the occasion of his birthday. Take a look at, for some reason, I, uh, oh, here is my cursor. Take a look at the, the details when you look at this cloud color of the attendant here and here, you will see how um, these pieces of clothing are used later in fashion as we proceed in time. So just the, the faces are made with such delicate stitches. If you look at this in uh, in uh, uh, zoomed out mode. Again, remember this color and remember the ends of the sleeves, these different sleeve bands and ribbons that adorn this gown. You'll see more of this later. This is one of the, the favorite uh, jackets with theatrical scenes in the collection. And uh, again, what I would like you to pay attention to is, first of all, you see there are no sleeve bands. So this jacket could be adorned even more, could have been adorned even more if the sleeve bands had been selected. It has an enormously um, complicated applique cloud color. And when you look at the, the decoration, what is interesting about this, except for its sheer beauty, is that different techniques have been employed. So there is cursor weaving, which means that the seams that you see on the main body of the garment are actually woven. There is the uh, this stitched on use of decorative ribbons and the, the trim. And if you 
we look at this in detail, in this case, you have to believe me, you can't really see it, but um, there is also painted detail. For instance, the antenna of this butterfly are painted onto the silk ground. And another detail, I think here you, you can get an idea of this is not woven and this is not embroidered. This is very finely painted onto the silk. This is a second similar um, jacket. Again, you have the sleeve bands that could still be selected and you have narrative roundels that tell a story and you have a very elaborate color, trim, and the decorative ribbons that are marking sort of the end of the narrative in the center of the garment. This is sort of the cheaper version, if you would want to call it this way, because this is a gauze jacket and it is not quite as densely decorated as the one we just saw. But again, um, here, one modular piece, the part of the, the center part of the color, and you can see very clearly that it has been very delicately embroidered. Now I just want to show you a few more images because I was also reminded to give you some eye candy, not just text. And there will be more text later. This is one of the uh, uh, favorite gowns of one of the collectors who actually, from whom Gertrude Bass Warner received this gown. And uh, it shows the decor of a hundred children playing. Again, you can see there are ribbons at the end of the sleeves, but the, the very end has a sleeve band that is very interesting because it is only, um, the decor is only visible on the back side, which I will show you in a, mo in a moment. I chose this detail to show you the uh, baiting stitch, this uh, secret stitch of a knot in a knotted form can be seen just on this vase on this garment. And of course the bats, auspicious bats, flying above the children. So here you see the back of the same garment and you see that the sleeves have been, the sleeve bands are decorated with um, a lot of symbolic objects that uh, come from the appreciation of antiquities. So there are uh, um, objects that you would also find in the scholar studio. And here another gown very beautifully executed with a woven, with woven roundels, with a lantern decor, and then um, the modular piece of the sleeve end in the typical shape of a um, horse's hoof that was characteristic for Manju um, garments. And here are details again, lanterns on the trim of the sleeves that are repeated in the color. And the, the buttons that used to be uh, usually uh, cloth on cloth with cloth buttons here in the Qing Dynasty were often, have often changed to metal buttons. And I wanted to show you a selection of sleeve bands just to show you that these um, pieces that could be exchanged in a garment were also really executed with great care. So I will talk a little bit about this modular production and uh, uh, we'll, you will remember the images I just showed you and then um, transfer this 
and I will remind you again to garments to come. The ingenuity of modular production in Chinese manufacturing of works of art, whether it is bronzes, ceramics, porcelain, architectural elements, and even the Chinese script has been explored, explored by art historians for many years. Modular production was employed in all three areas of manufacturing, process, content, and form. From the earliest times, modular production aimed at an economic use of materials in the workshop, at a production according to high quality standards of objects that could also be manufactured in series. And I'm very cautious, it's not mass production, it's serial production, there's a big difference. A design that presented a language of auspicious symbols, an iconography that elicits immediate associations with defi defined value concepts, with historical persons or locations, with religious beings or mythical animals. And such designs were applied in a wide variety of materials across chronological periods with iconography that referenced familiar symbols. The modular mode of production also included the specialization of work steps and therefore the employment of trained artisans who specialize in a particular skill or task. When you think about the terracotta army that most of you have seen at some point, these terracotta soldiers were also produced in piece mold or the textiles, as we saw, weaving in a particular pattern, specialization in embroidery stitches, and the pagoda that Dennis mentioned, the way the pagoda is constructed, you can take it down in parts. And as he mentioned, it is actually made in the way you would construct as an architect a pagoda from scratch. Only fairly recently, this modular mode of production has been analyzed with regard to items of fashionable clothing. Cultural historian Dorothy Cole and Chinese literature scholar Sarah Duncy have worked on shoes for bound feet and costume items respectively. Rachel Silberstein has presented us with a close reading of the connections between textile production and commerce in the 18th century and has researched the evolution of fashionable attire that most Western commentators previously failed to recognize and acknowledge. Rachel Silverstein is in Washington, in Seattle, so she would be a good guest in the future for PDX for uh, uh, First Saturday. What we learn from their studies is that fashion is not the fast paced change of ostentatious garments and colors selected according to the Pantone color scheme. Instead, fashion in 18th century China is expressed in cut and color, but also in the designs of the exchangeable parts of a garment, the collar, the sleeve bands, and the border trim ribbons that most women could, that most women could afford and that they could buy in a store or from a peddler, and then they could assemble this at home. I have a few more sleeve bands for you. and colors. Fashion also brought changes in the production of clothes. Design patterns were still predominantly woven in the Ming and were often embroidered in the Qing dynasty, which of course then facilitated this modular production. This also increased the numbers of uh, women and men working as professional embroiderers. And yes, there were lots of men organized in guilds as professional embroiderers. Changeable parts of garment, of a garment like color, sleeve bands, etc., could be adorned with pictorial embroidery, as we just saw, the story of the stone, story of the Western chamber, with the latest design of auspicious symbols, floral patterns, or figural scenes celebrated in novels and especially theater plays popular at the time. There were pattern books for the weaving, weaving patterns of ribbons from which the fashionable lady could choose when making her order, as well as pattern books for the embroidered roundels that, that transported scenes of theatrical plays onto garments. Here is such a roundel, you can see it has been finished and could be transported and then very finely soon onto a garment. 
There were also applique sheets that modeled the applique that could be transferred to the garment. So here you see three examples of such um, applique on paper, and then it would be cut out and very carefully transferred onto the garment. Let's come to the part, the second part of my talk, sericulture, and concentrating on the pictures of tilling and weaving. In the Southern Song Dynasty, 1127 to 1279, an official named Lo Shu, sometimes called Lo Cho, Lo Sho, is uh, the, the character can be, has several pronunciations. And of course, we cannot ask him today how he wanted to be pronounced. He hailed from Zhejiang and had been appointed to diverse regions, including the capital Kaifeng and the previous capital Kaifeng under the Northern Song, and as far south as Guangzhou in his career. He came to be posted in Yutian County, about 25 miles west of Hangzhou, located in the most productive rice cultivating, cultivating area and one of the silk centers of China. Between 1132 and 1134, he produced two sets of paintings, 21 on rice production and 24 on sericulture with matching verses for each of the paintings in which he explains in which he references the scenes. According to comments by Lo's nephew, Lo Yao, recorded in 1210, and his grandson, Lo Hong, the paintings had been presented to the first emperor of the Southern Song, Gaozong, by their uncle, Lo Shu, on the occasion of an audience with the emperor in 1153 or 1154, about 20 years after Lo had completed the two sets. The delighted emperor ordered the paintings to be displayed on, in the back palace, that is the residential quarters of the imperial family. The moral message to the emperor was clear. Agriculture and sericulture are the two pillars on which the prosperity of the states rests. Neglect either one, and the envisioned ideal of a harmonious society is in jeopardy. Emperor Gaozong understood this and was even quoted saying, rearing silkworms should be done in the imperial palace so that all will know the hardship of farm work. China as the largest agricultural society in the world always needed to ensure that the population had at least a basic food supply. This concern was reflected in the old Confucian demand that maintaining the stability of society was the first task of the emperor and his government. Good government equals welfare of the people. Therefore, the imperial governments promoted both pillars of China's rural world, agriculture and sericulture. The paintings came to confer legitimacy on the, of the, uh, on the political order and were thus continued to be produced in various contexts throughout the imperial period. Lo Shu came from a family of civil officials with a strong sense of Confucian responsibility of the, the welfare of the population in the district he oversaw. His and his colleagues' commitments, commitment doesn't come as a surprise since the Song Dynasty had just lost a terrible war resulting in the occupation of about a third of their territory through the Jurchen Jin Dynasty, the ancestors of the Manju. So, you see the Jin have occupied all of Northern China, and this is the remaining territory of the Southern Song. Food security for the local population, as well as the newly migrated refugees to the South, there was about a million refugees um, that consisted just of government officials, soldiers, etc. not to talk about the, uh, the population that couldn't really be accounted for because these were times of devastation who left the North and had to be accommodated by the South. This food security was of the essence and therefore the promotion of agriculture the improvement of agricultural technology was a primary concern of state officials, and so was the production of silk, 
not just used to tailor clothes, but also as one of the currencies for indemnity payments to the Jurchen, to the Jin, that had to be continued on a high level of both output and quality. We have to uh, uh, remind us that the Song had to pay the Jin every year about 250,000 tiles of silver and the same amount in bolts of silk. Annual payments in silk and silver were the pre precarious guarantee that the Jin would continue to keep the peace. While these payments were cheaper for the Southern Song than waging war, they also presented a di diplomatic obligation of the highest order, certainly significant enough to avoid delays of delivery and instead demonstrate that honoring the contract that bartered material goods for peace in the empire was of the utmost concern to the Southern Song government. Loshu's images came to be identified as a political program to such an extent that other emperors commissioned new sets and artisan workshops reproduce the artisan workshops reproduce the images in other media as woodblock prints painted on ceramics, fans, carved into lacquerware, into molds for the decoration of exquisite ink cakes, elegant accoutrements for the scholar's studio. The genre scenes were also painted in watercolors of, uh, for collectible albums and on wallpaper made for export, as I will show you in a moment. The reproduction of the iconic series of images took off in the Qing dynasty when Manchu Emperor Kangxi commissioned a set that was created by Jiao Bingzhen, an official of the Imperial Observatory, who was also very good in painting. Under Imperial sponsorship, Jiao produced a remarkable new series of illustrations for the pictures of tilling and weaving. One of the sets Jiao had drawn with single point linear perspective, then new to China, that was introduced by the Jesuit missionaries. His paintings were transferred into woodblocks by the carver Zhu Gui. And by the way, the illustrations influenced by drawings with Western perspective were considered clever, but the usefulness was questioned. So people were not so interested in, more interested in the content and um, yeah, then in the perspective at this point. Emperor Yongzheng, Kangxi's son, commissioned one edition of Ganju Two images and his son, Emperor Tianlong, had two sets of pictures of tilling and weaving produced. One of them carved in, in outlines in stone and accompanied by his own Emperor Tianlong's poems. He wrote a lot of poems and Chinese connoisseurs of literature say there were a lot. They were kind of mediocre, but I can't judge this because of course I wish I wish I could write poetry like Emperor Tianlong. <laughs> Francesca Bray has counted that today there are still about 60 editions and variants of the Ganja Chu of the pictures of, of tilling and weaving in existence throughout East Asia. So you see how from one emperor to the next over the period of many dynasties, from the Song to the Qing, emperors commissioned these images and collected them. But not only did the pictures of tilling and weaving inspire consumers to acquire copies of these elegant images, the didactic influence went far beyond their commercial success. For 17 years, from 1763 to 1780, Henri Bertin served as a minister of state. There were five ministers of state in France under Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th. I went ahead of my slides, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you which versions of pictures of tilling and weaving we have in the museum. There are two woodblock print albums, a set of ink cakes, an album of watercolors, an eight 
panel folding screen from Korea and a 12 woodblock print set by Kitagawa Utamaro. Very interesting because it's sort of tongue in cheek. It's not as serious as the emperors had this topic in mind. So here is on the left, the cover of the copy of the Gangju 2 in the library. Then second, um, one page of the second album that actually shows you there is no writing. Um, when you remember, I showed you this image and you see that the accompanying calligraphy shows the poetry that comments on this depiction. And this is missing here, which suggests that this imagery could be used or this album could be used to make copies and then transfer these copies onto other materials, maybe even fabric. Here is an ink cake with the uh, important sections highlighted with gold. And finally, the watercolor album, one page of it that uh, was very cherished by um, foreigners and therefore produced in large quantities for export. And you also see that um, sericulture, the work in sericulture was not limited to women because it's men here collecting the leaves of the mulberry tree to feed the silkworms. This is a Korean screen, which shows you that the artist here took the liberty of combining the series of agriculture and the series of paintings of sericulture in one um, set. And of course, this is just a segment of the uh, many paneled screen. And here is the uh, print by Kitagawa Utamaro with the ladies engaging. These are not farm ladies who are engaging in sericulture, collecting the or sorting the cocons. Now, the influence of pictures of tilling and weaving. Henri Bertin served as a minister of state under Louis XV and the XVI. And greatly influenced by the widely shared images of our image of China as an enlightened empire, ruled by a wise and benevolent monarch assisted by learned scholar officials, Bertin promoted this model of an ideal way of ruling to be emulated by the French monarch, together with the import of all those practical or mechanical skills, crafts, manufacturing techniques, and technology that would help him and his ministers to achieve this ambitious goal. For this purpose, Bertin engaged in a lively exchange with the French Jesuits at the Qing court in Beijing, participating in and giving support to a purposeful acquisition of images or a business of pictures, as he called it, that would help the French recipients to better understand the written descriptions by their informants in China. So the Jesuits had sent reports from what is exceptional in China for a long time, but now to have imagery, that was Bertin's interest. His interest in China made him the center of a circle of about 50 like-minded French intellectuals, as well as the Royal Library in, in Paris, whose names can, uh, we can learn from archival material that documents the shipments of objects and images of, uh, from China. So that has all been nicely recorded. And one can actually associate names of recipients in Paris with the, the shipments from China. Where does his interest for uh, silk come from? In the 1750s, Bertin had worked in Lyon, the French center of silk manufacturing, where he also oversaw the import of silk from China. This initial encounter should keep alive his fascination with China throughout his life. When two Chinese Catholic priests who had been sent from China to France for their ordination applied to Bertin for spaces on a ship of the East 
India Company of France to return to China. He came up with the idea to employ them as correspondents who would report about how things were done in China once they returned to their homeland. He asked them to extend their stay in France for another year to add a special training to their theological education. The special training he organized for them consisted of studying various technical aspects of manufacturing tapestries and porcelain, studying sciences and mechanics, as well as drawing, so that they could enhance their written reports with images to explain the differences of how things were done in China from the same processes in France. Bertin hoped that the reports would be instrumental in securing the most authentic knowledge of China at the time, a project that he pursued until the end of his life and that resulted in 15 volumes documenting his exchange with the French Jesuit mission in Beijing, titled Articles on the History, Science, Arts, etc. of the Chinese. These volumes were published between, between 1776 and 1791. The two young priests, Alois Ge or Gao, I'm not quite sure because I don't have their Chinese characters and couldn't find them, and Etienne Yang arrived back in Beijing in 1766. They had come from Christian families who had been converted to Catholicism by French Jesuits. As young men, the Jesuits had taught them Latin and religion, preparing them to travel to France for their ordination as priests. At the age of 18 and 19, Yang and Ke, or Gao, had sailed from Guangzhou in 1754. And when they returned, they were 29 and 30. Equipped with a practical training in the arts and sciences, learned in the royal manufacturers where goods were made for the court in Paris and the silk manufacturers of Lyon, the paper manufacturers of Anony. Oh, here is a uh, title picture of one of the um, volumes of the articles on the history, etc. And that's uh, Father Amiot, who was the uh, correspondent among the French Jesuits in Beijing who corresponded intensively with Bertin. The, uh, um, equipped with the practical training in the arts and sciences that they learned, these two gentlemen, among them in the paper manufacturers of Anony, this is of course a slightly later <laughs> photograph, as well as agricultural production and the manufacturing of objects and tools from steel, copper, iron. They learned about the mining industry, the production of weapons, the production of glass and enamel, and the chemistry of glazes. The two priests set out to preach and pray to their Chinese audience, and in their free time, report to the French minister and his circle about the differences they observed between production processes in France and China. They wrote their reports, which they illustrated with etchings guided by the question of Bertin and the members of the French Academy of Sciences, among them 52 questions by Jacques Turgot, intendant of the Generalité of Limoges. And he asked about wealth, the distribution of land and agriculture, 30 questions, paper making, printing, and textiles, 15 questions, and natural history and natural sciences, seven questions. So that was the, the begin of their reporting. Among the books and materials the young priests sent to Paris was a book, now you hear the bell ringing, of plowing and silkworms, a Gangetu version. Probably one of the two sets of Gangetu albums currently in the collection of rare books in the Bibliothèque Nationale. The collection also included two etchings made by Yang or Gao that produce, um, reproduce the seventh image of the Kangxi Commission series of Gang Gangetu images, a scene titled First Seedlings that Yao had added to the first images painted by Lo Shu. And I apologize for the bad quality. I copied this from a high gloss paper on my 
home printer. This is the result of COVID and the book arriving late. Their task as correspondents had not started with ease. Upon arrival in Guangzhou, the gifts the priest had sent had been sent with to be presented to the Qing emperor and that should help them establish their reputation and eventually reliable contract, contacts. Let's go back to this. Were seized by the governor general of Guangdong province and could not be sent to Beijing. Since 1760, since 1760, communications between the missionaries in Guangdong and Beijing had been severely restricted. These new regulations included letters and books sent from Europe and travels of newly arrived members of the French mission. And of course, also gifts because the official in Guangzhou wasn't sure whether the emperor would appreciate it. It took intense negotiations by Fa Father Benoist of the Beijing mission to receive permission that the gifts from the freshly minted missionaries from France could finally be, de be delivered to the hands of the Emperor Tianlong. They arrived in December 1766 and a delighted Tianlong decided to display the tapestries in a new building. He, he received two huge tapestries. This building was called Yuanyingguan, View of Distant Seas, and it was to be built in the Yuanmingyuan since the existing buildings were too small for the tapestries. And that's the garden that was destroyed later by the Allied forces. If you travel to Beijing, you can um, visit it. And that's also the place where this, excuse me, this huge fountain that functioned as a clock with the zodiac animals' heads had been destroyed. Many of the heads had been stolen by foreign soldiers, where some of them were just repatriated. And if you have come to Eugene at some point during this time, you may have seen Ai Weiwei's rendering of the zodiac heads in the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Sericulture as the technical foundation for the production of an exquisite fabric was not only recognized as it came to be documented in painting and prints in Asia. As Chinese silk and the knowledge of the technology of silk production conquered the world, and with them this, its idealizations of manual labor and agriculture, its associations with a balanced rule over a harmonious society, and last not least, its promise for profits occupied minds of heads of state and merchants alike. Surrey cultural experiments had been started in the 17th century. Yes, and now we see her, Queen Elizabeth I. <clears throat> she uh, actually continued initial attempts at Surrey culture that really gained momentum in the 17th century under James I who in January 1609 ordered the planting of mulberry trees at the location of today's Buckingham Palace in a failed attempt to rear his own silk worms. <clears throat> he did not pursue this much further in Britain, but turned to the colonies. Instead of cultivating tobacco, which he detested, he called it the Virginia weed, he asked that the colonists use the leaves of the red mulberry tree growing in abundance in Virginia as the food for silkworms, since he wanted to save the money, about 200,000 pounds per year, he spent on imports of the Piedmont region in Italy. And uh, Queen Elizabeth actually owns a national collection of mulberries, yes, since 2000, brand new. In Russia, Peter the Great, also experimented with sericulture during his reforms in the early 18th century. And then, of course, Monticello. Thomas Jefferson experimented with sericulture in Monticello. Several of his grandchildren, children from his daughter Martha, spent time with him during his retirement in Monticello, where he oversaw their education. 
In a letter dated June 11th, 1811 to his granddaughter Cornelia, who had left Monticello briefly for a visit of her older married sister Anne, he wrote, my dear Cornelia, your family of silkworms is reduced to a single individual that is now spinning, spinning its brooch. To encourage your sisters, Mary and Virginia, to take care of it, I tell them, as soon as they can get wedding gowns from this spinner, they shall be married. I propose the same to you, that in order to hasten its work, you may hasten home. Well, Jefferson's example shows the association of sericulture and women teaching young girls patience. You get it. And here is very briefly a map of silk cocoon production in the US in 1842. Of course, leaving out the move to the West where experiments were made in California. Sericulture was also promoted by Prussia's Frederick the Great in Bavaria, in Poland, Sweden, and Finland, all areas and climates that didn't support sericulture on a large scale. This was different in Mexico, where silk production due to an abundance of mulberry trees was envisioned to be lucrative by the Spanish who brought the first silkworms to Oaxaca in 1523 and taught the indigenous population the art of silk cultivation. The tradition has recently reviewed, uh, received new attention through the artistic contributions of young silk weavers and their creation, creations. Here are a few examples. I hope that this short journey to the JSMA and through the history of sericulture has shed a bit of light of this fascination with silk that those involved in its production feel. Which brings me back, of course, to Gertrude Bass Warner. She grew up during a time when silk production was still pursued in many areas in the US. And she observed silk production firsthand in rural settings and in industrial manufacturers in China, Korea, and Japan. And as you know, her fascination led her to experiment with wearing silkworms and observe their transformation when they started to create their cocons in her own house. Uh, just a brief moment, I must be out of time already about the digital exhibition. What you find there is the basic weaves of Chinese silk selected embroidery stitches beautifully illustrated by the artist Ian Coleman, the art of Kose tapestry weave, expressions of fashion in the decor of sleeve bands, colors, and decorative roundels, as I reported, details of a theater rope that I showed you, examples of Manju ceremonial attire. The, uh, for those of you who are interested in the, the technical side, the exhibition was created in Omeka S and includes two story maps showing um, locations of silk production and uh, travels by Gertrude Bas Warner. And Omeka S is specifically suitable for institutions interested in connecting digital cultural heritage collections and then these uh, story maps are made with ArcGIS, ArcGIS story maps is the name of the program. So you see, we could connect two collections. And here is Dennis's Pagoda inviting you all to come. And as of this morning, <laughs> I was able, you are the first to see this to show you images of the new installation, the new rotation of the installation. So Dennis, you haven't seen this yet. Robe, robes for emperor on the right and empress on the left. Two military outfits, one with a helmet, very delicate work. Two sets of skirts which haven't been shown for a long time. I haven't seen them in the exhibition. And two 
beautiful robes, which also show you very clearly what we talked about, the modular production, which you then can also explore in this folk print. Thank you so much for your attention. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Sim, for this great talk. Um, we, are, um, we have run a little past our time, but that is totally fine because I know we had some longer opening remarks. Um, just a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and feel free to type in your question. Um, if you're having problems with that, you can also type it into the chat. And we'll give the audience a moment uh, or two to um, put in any questions. We did have a comment in the chat, Dr. Sim, from Mike Roberts. Um, he says, great presentation. Xie xie. Xie xie. Um, I have a very generic question to start us off with. Um, can you speak more about the process of silk embroidery, like how it's made and the length of time it takes to go through that process? Oh, um, well, what maybe what I could do is I can switch from this image to the website and show you some examples. How about that? Um, for that, I will have to share my screen again. Let me quickly find, call up the website. Okay, I have the website and now I just have to make sure that I can see our communication and share my screen. So you should be able to see this is the welcome page of the digital exhibition. And uh, when there is, of course, plenty of text, and this invites you to explore more, there is some information about Gertrude Bass Warner. And when I click on this, you can access the information, including letters, the exchange of letters between her and Ferguson here, one of the, the people who were um, her or, or her supporters of the the plan to create a museum. So John Calvin Ferguson was uh, located in Nanjing, actually in his living room, where probably the first um, educational uh, uh, events that ultimately led to the founding of Nanjing University. But uh, he knew about Gertrude Bass Warner's plans to found a museum, and he was on the lookout for her and contacted her when he found objects. And now um, collecting silk. So here is the detail I showed you previously, but uh, also explanations for Taoist robes, for dragon robes, the rank badges, an image robe and the, the hangings that I mentioned before. Then we have collecting pictures of tilling and weaving and you can now, this is the, the cover you saw, but you can actually move through the albums and see all pages if you desire to do that. And then when we go to producing silk, then we have the story map that shows you the locations of the Imperial Silk Workshops. And under producing silk, you have a survey for the most basic weaves of silk, the famous Kursa tapestry weave, how that is produced. It shows you clearly 
what it means when the, the term is translated as cut silk, you see that the colors don't overlap, which creates between the different colors a kind of tiny slit. So when you hold this against light, you will actually see where the, the colors are not connected in the garment. That is a very, very difficult technique and therefore garments in Kusa are very um, expensive. And at the bottom behind the weaves, we come to your embroidery. So a uh, question, here are different stitches that show you, for instance, when you wanted to express shading, like uh, the, the area on which the hair in the moon is standing, who's pounding the elixir of immortality, you see how the embroiderer layered the stitches with applying shorter and longer stitches and then getting into the distances or into the, the lacune between the stitches and starting the shading with different colors. And of course, for clarity, this is done here with contrasting colors, but you could also uh, of course, achieve this kind of shading by using the same color in a different shade from dark blue to light blue or dark green to light green, etc. So yeah, this is uh, what I wanted to show you also. <laughs> you have um, scenes of the Ganjutu, of pictures of tilling and weaving, not only on ink cakes and porcelain, but also in embroidery or on textiles. And here you can see what I just mentioned, the overlaying between the colors of the stitches so that the shading effect is achieved. And let's go back one step. This is the seed stitch. This is this, which has this kind of knotted appearance. That's why it also called, it's also called the knot stitch that you saw in the vase um, that one of the little children holds in the detail image of the hundred uh, children at play gown. See whether we can see the Beijing stitch. Yes, you can see it. This is actually very nice because you can see the difference between this uh, Tang stitch and the Beijing stitch that you see on the altar cloth here, and also on the bamboo leaves or the, the leaves of the tree, not, it's a tree, not a bamboo stalk, and also in these rocks. Yeah, here it's even better. You can see it quite clearly. So how, how did people, and, and here's um, Koso explained again in, in extra, um, drawings that show you you could have the the style with the slits where only once in a while the colors sort of reach into the field of the second color to give the fabric fabric stability or um, actually attaching but uh, only leaving out some of the transition threads so that you also keep the two fields of two colors separate. How did people start to become embroiderers? Well, um, for women, it's pretty clear that they started in the household. When embroidery became lucrative, especially in the Qing, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, was already an established tradition of embroidery with master embroiderers and the, uh, uh, the, the center of embroidery where we have publications of styles of embroidery was in Suzhou. So people really started to, or tried to aim at the quality of Suzhou embroidery, which was tightly um, associated with the name of the Gu family. The ladies of the Gu family were probably the, the most famous embroiderers and to reach their standard was something that people aspire to. How long did it take to learn all stitches and become a professional embroiderer? I cannot tell you because um, yes, there were guilds, um, uh, uh, embroidery guilds that taught embroidery, but also assigned sort of the, the work and connected employers and employees or um, distributed the commissions that were made by certain patrons to the respective embroiderers, how long their education took before they could take over a certain commission, I cannot tell you. I don't know whether that is recorded anywhere. I would have to look it up. Thank you so much for um, all the details there. <laughs> that was great to see. We do have a couple questions in our Q&A box. Uh, this one is a two-part one. Uh, Moshi Gordon asks, do we know any names attributed to the women who produced some of these exquisite pieces of art? Or were there any women of note who were famous for a particular stitch who were called upon to produce a particularly important piece of clothing or part of a piece of clothing. Wait, can you repeat the last part of the sentence? Yeah. Um, uh, if the question is referencing if there's any women of note who were called upon to uh, pr produce a particularly important piece of clothing or part of a piece of clothing. Of course, the, the patrons who uh, you wanted to have a certain quality who would definitely go to renowned embroiderers and the Gu family and the, the people who made a name for themselves, who copied their quality of production. They were known in the, in the textile world. Now, do we have lists of names of particular ladies? One would have to look up um, in the guild records, aside from the Gu family. Yes, there are a few, but um, one, yeah, one would have to look in the literature about the, the guilds who, who was sort of the, the most, who received the most commissions. When it comes to imperial embroidery from imperial textiles, of course, these were done in the imperial workshops. And there, it was not about the individual, it was about modular production. So people who were the artisans who were really um, especially excellent at embroidering in a certain in a particular style, for instance, these uh, narrative roundels, the pictorial roundels, they would concentrate on that. If when you think about the, the gown, the green gown with the lanterns, that would be a work that would be uh, where the roundels would be done by a particular um, embroiderer who concentrated or, or specialized in this kind of embroidery. Whether you as an individual would, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to make a commission to the imperial workshops, but uh, in the textile world, in Sichuan, 
in Jiangsu, in Zhejiang, people knew exactly who to go to. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, another question comes from Anne Wetherill. She comments, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Were there standard sizes and shapes for the yardage used in jackets? Yes, they were. Um, and you know that uh, the, the width of a bolt of silk it may have changed or it did change over time but was normed for, for instance, the imperial production. So when they sent the payments to the Jin, those were all standardized bolts of silk and bolts of silk differed in width from time to time, but uh, were standardized. And then to, of course, the, um, a jacket that you would order to be made with a tailor would be made according to your measurements. But um, the yardage itself, because that was standardized, sort of uh, suggested how the different parts, the main part, the body part of the, the jacket or the gown, the sleeves, the, the, uh, the lining, how all of that would be distributed within the yardage. I also have to say that when you think about ready-made clothing, that is an appearance of later times. So most jackets, if it were the, they were not sewn, produced in the household, but by a workshop, they would have certain standards, for instance, the, the width of the, the sleeves, because that's not dependent on an individual's measurements, but uh, then you would alter, for instance, the width of the color, because of course that uh, is different from individual to individual. And the size of the, the color that you would um, produce, these sizes were also, they were made in different sizes so that they could accommodate different sized people. I hope that answers your question. I think it's a great job. <laughs> um, we've got some more questions. Let's see if we can get to them. Um, Suzanne Silverstein asks, um, going back to the guilds, are, um, excuse me, so there was a guild and there were both women and men who were members? Yes, guild, guilds organized the work and they separated very strictly the work that was done by men and the work that was done by women. So you couldn't say, okay, I start this and then I give it to Mr. So-and-so and he will complete it. That was a, um, a big inhibition. The, the, um, uh, the guilds who organized the commissioned works were run by men and they could employ women outside of the guild and households, but they wouldn't mix these pieces of work. That's very interesting, thank if you. If you want to know more about this, the best, that's why I, I mentioned she would be a fabulous guest for First Saturday. The best um, research done in this field has been done by Rachel Silverstein. And she just recently in uh, last year published a book, which is titled, let me find, because I got it right here. It's titled A Fashionable Century, Text Textile Artistry and Commerce in the Late Qing. She really looked very carefully 
at production and the, the conditions. And uh, she is among the first who really reads the pieces of work, but also the social conditions of the production, the background, um, looking at you, as you know, as I just mentioned, ready-made clothing is uh, appears at a later time, and there are a lot of points to consider, like pawn shops, when people, when fashion changed or when people um, had needed to get money for some reason, or when you consider the big social uh, changes in the end of the Qing, even before the dynasty uh, collapsed and the Republic was, Republic was founded, a lot of people associated these traditional, this traditional style of clothing with being backward. So it lost some of its cultural importance and also its social currency really when modernity hit and different kinds of different styles of clothing became fashionable. That, of course, is not a, this is a sliding process. So I'm so sorry. I muted my phone. So when people brought clothing that they didn't need anymore, not just for the necessity to get money, but uh, when people got rid of clothing that they brought to pawn shops or sold because they didn't need it anymore because they were really eager to get into a modern or what was considered modern at the time, especially in the urban centers, a modern outfit, then the clothing that previously was revealing high standard or high status was brought to what entered the market for resale in different uh, ways. And so this kind of reusing clothing, she has researched very interestingly with lots of aspects. I, I think the, the, the technical aspects and the uh, numbers that I'm not even sure one can really establish this, but the implications of this political change at the time and the insecurity, what is the Republic? What is expected of us? What is, what are the markers of modernity in the attire, in clothing? That was something that lasted for a long time and made some of the clothing obsolete, some of the, the interest in traditional clothing lingered, continued, especially when we consider that, for instance, Yuan Shikai, remember, he tried to get rid of the Republic and found his own dynasty. It didn't last and it, <laughs> he died within the same year when he attempted this, but all of this political unrest also left an unrest in people on what are these standards? What is, what does clothing, clothing imply for the generation that was born, let's say between 1907 and 1925? So in this period, there was so much change and uh, what uh, she looked at in, in her book gives the technical aspects. But when you think about this time and you read about this time period and the, the political change, what this actually means for people going from an imperial 
from an empire, from an imperial system of ranks, of um, the display of wealth to the Republic and its completely new set of ideas of modernity and how this is expressed in clothing. There is lots of work still to be done. An interesting question. Absolutely. Um, just for those that can see the chat, um, we put the, the title uh, of the book and the author and a link as well to the book. And we'll try to have that on the website as well. Great. Yeah. And she's at the University of Washington. So I'm sure um, it would be worthwhile to ask her for a presentation. We'll put her on the list for sure. Um, we have a few more questions if you everyone sure, will. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Quayle, uh, she says, thank you very much for this illuminating presentation and asks, were there qualities of silk that could only be used for emperor and royalty? Was there silk made for businessmen or scholars? Well, silk as a fabric, um, just has different kinds of weaves. And yes, there were cuts and colors reserved for the emperor and the imperial household, the imperial family. But uh, that doesn't mean that businessmen who were interested in buying silk couldn't do so. But there were sartorial regulations and they limited the use of certain colors. You know, the imperial yellow that was really um, limited on uh, to the emperor and the Empress. And I think maybe the most um, clear example, I will quickly go to the dragon robes. The clear example that um, most people associate, <clears throat> oh, I clicked on, the wrong link, sorry for that. When you look at this gown, and you look at the, the claws of the dragon, if the dragon has five claws, that's an imperial gown. It's only to be worn by the emperor. If the dragon has four claws, that's for the imperial princes. The princes, the sons of the emperor could wear a decor of dragons with four claws, but not five. Even they were excluded from having five claws. So there is a specific iconography that has to be in a gown for the emperor for a specific ceremony, for a certain um, occasions. But that doesn't mean that, for instance, the um, satin of, that is sort of the, the ground fabric for this robe couldn't be worn by somebody else. But you just couldn't have this decor. But you could buy in, in stores, you could buy silk and have clothing made for yourself. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go to our next question from Sabina Hoon. She's, she says, thank you, Dr. Sim, for such a wonderful and educational presentation. Is Sarah culture done entirely or partially by machine nowadays? Well, um, Sericulture, the part of the silk production when it comes to feeding the silkworms and reeling the cocons is still done by hand by people because the silkworms are very meticulous pets, I can tell you. <laughs> so as long as you feed them, they eat, they munch and munch and munch away during the period when they um, prepare to transform, to 
build the cocoon. And you have to take care of them. You cannot alter the temperature. You cannot uh, have loud music, no heavy metal for silkworms. They will stop munching and then they will stop producing the cocoon. But then when it comes to using, after you uh, basically fish, or oh, how is this done? Just a second. I have this at home because of course I'm teaching. So you have the cocoon. Now what you do, you have to put this into hot water, boiling water, to loosen up the sericin that keeps the fibers stuck together in the cocoon. So it will release the fibers and then you collect the fibers in the water and take, depending on the ultimate weight of the silk, three or five or seven or 12 of these enormously fine fibers and you reel them off the cocoon. And that is done, the feeding the uh, reel wheel, the reeling wheel is done by hand. But then the weaving process after you have dressed the loom, the weaving process is done by machines today. So you have huge jacquard looms that are able to produce high quality brocade, for instance, the, the most complicated weave that you can do with silk. And uh, that of course was invented in Lyon, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's done by machines. And if you have the chance after COVID is over to travel to China, you could go to Hangzhou and visit the Silk Museum there. And you have mechanical looms where people actually demonstrate how this is done. That same is true for the Yunjin Cloud, Muse Cloud Brocade Museum in Nanjing. Um, Often there are in tourist tours offered, uh, visits offered to go and see the process in a manufacturer. So it shouldn't be too difficult to actually see this in action. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna do one more question. Um, before we wrap up. And this one comes from uh, Moshi Gordon. Uh, comment first is, thank you so much for the very interesting talk along with the photographs, fascinating. And the question is, were the dyes stable? Did they run? What was used for the dyes? Oh, that's a very interesting question. There is a whole <laughs> uh, vast literature and as your question reveals that you know about the uh, sensitivity of dyes. Yes, the, the dyes um, were made stable with mordants and there are different mordants for different colors, as you may know. So the, the whole chemistry of dyeing and dyeing perfectly so that it is acceptable under the scrutiny of imperial eyes in the workshops that um, produce the silk for imperial use, these, the, the dyeing workshops had a vast selection of dyes, of dye stuffs, natural dye stuffs of mordants to make the silk, um, to make the, the color stable. However, the light sensitivity is uh, still given. So if you expose even colors that are of uh, traditional, these traditional gowns that are considered to be stable to a long light exposure, sun exposure, they will fade. 
That's why Gertrude Bass Warner, you may remember it in case you had the time to come in Rose Kitagawa's talk, took out the, the windows in the museum when the newly built uh, uh, structure was when it uh, had been designed with windows and she learned she at the time uh, uh, was in, a member in several associations to learn more about textiles and how to conserve them, preserve them and uh, do the same for paper, of course. She learned that light and sensitivity is a great danger. And so she had all the windows of the museum removed and they are now in the library, <laughs> they were used for the building of the library. And that's when you come and visit, you will see that the niches in which the windows were located are filled. So there are no windows, they're just the, the frames where the brick frames where windows were supposed to be originally. But yes, there's a, a vast literature about um, dyes, mordants, and how to keep them as stable as possible. Thank you so much for that. We've um, get, gotten to the end of our Q&A session. Um, Dr. Sim, thank you again for giving us this talk this morning. Um, just wanted to give you a few moments if you have any last comments. Well, thank you all for coming. And please explore the website. If you have questions, there is an uh, uh, address. You can shoot an email. And um, I should also say we're working, still working on the Chinese version of the website. The, the content is there. It has all been translated, but um, we're still waiting for this to be put into the, the technical uh, um, placement is an issue. So <laughs> it's, it takes a bit, but hopefully it will be up um, in the foreseeable future. And thanks for coming. I know this first Saturday, these first Saturday programs have friends and I'm glad that you could come today. And I'm very grateful that I can actually be part of the 20th anniversary. First Saturday was one of the first uh, organizations that I got to know about when I came to Oregon and uh, I learned about the Chinese garden and went and visited often. And there I came in contact with First Saturday. So congratulations to all of you who have accompanied the uh, first Saturday crew for a long time. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Uh, definitely want to second that. Thank you to our audience for being with us this season um, as we transition to online and um, for all the past seasons and your, um, your attendance and your support. Uh, just a reminder, feel free to check out our website. We'll put all of um, the links that we put in our chat um, up there as well. And the video for Dr. Sim's talk will also be up there shortly. And then also another reminder, um, our tea house, we're still doing that even though we've run a little past our time. Um, so feel free to go grab a cup of tea or a snack and join us in the tea house in a few minutes. Um, I think that's... That's it. So thank you again very, oh, really quick. There's a reminder of where to find the Tea House link on your confirmation email or your reminder email. All right, thank you again for coming and for sticking with us. And we hope you have a great summer and we'll see you soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>